Good morning. Welcome. It is going to be a good day. John knows we gave you some more seats down front here. Like we don't have the cameras down here anymore. We're like, we need some more chairs. So Jeremy moved into the back. So if you're watching online, you're in the back today. Sorry about that. Glad you're all here today. We're going to start off by singing together um, a great song that touches back to some old hymns and uh, great memories for me and maybe for you as well. It's called This Is My Song. So why don't you stand with us and we'll, we'll sing. Those melodies, those words we sang when, when I first believed. Songs of redemption, stories of hope, heaven awakened inside my soul. I sang in Christ alone, my solid ground, amazing. Family Church, go ahead and have a seat for me. I get to welcome you here today, and I'm so excited to do so. My name is Jess Allen. If you're joining us for the first time, this is a great weekend to be here. 
although I must confess, I think every weekend is a great weekend to be here, um, but I'm excited that you're here with us. If you are new here or if you're looking for your church home, we would love to give you more information about the church. All you have to do is fill out a connection card, or you can stop by and see Rhonda. She's had some practice, so she's ready. She's ready for you to stop by and see her at the resource table. But the one thing I want you to know about our church, if you are visiting or checking us out for the first time, is exactly why we exist. And that's so all of us can know God, find hope, live free, and do good. And so we hope that you recognize that in every single thing that we do today. One of the best things that we are doing today is not even happening in the service. It's happening after the service. At one o'clock, we are celebrating baptism, and we are so excited for those ready to take that step and go public with their belief in Jesus. Today, it's going to be, it's going to be, there we go. Today, at one at the Easter End YMCA. I had to use the confidence monitor there because I lost my confidence. It's gonna be today, and we would love for all of you to head that way after church and celebrate. And let me tell you, I was talking to somebody in the lobby, and they're like, you know, someone I know is really, really thinking that they might get baptized. If you're thinking it, it's probably time. If you're thinking it, the answer is yes. We will be ready. It doesn't matter. You can go in the water in the clothes that you're wearing. We're going to have a towel for you. We're going to erase all those excuses. What we want to do is celebrate with you. So we would love to see you there at 1 o'clock at the East Rand YMCA. For my next announcement or host comment, I'm going to bring up a guest host commenter who hasn't done host comments before. Are you ready? Yeah. Let's so show, so show some support. It's a little bit nerve-wracking to be up here, believe it or not. Sometimes you guys are very stoic and stone-faced. And I don't just know if you're hearing me or doing a good, if I'm doing a good job. But the guest host commenter is John Allen. Hey. <laughs> I've never done host comments before. <laughs> but anyway, and I'm, but I'm really excited because we have something that we want to share with you that's huge for our church. And we've been waiting for the day when we could share this with you. Uh, as if you've been around, you know that we've been continuing to grow and, and running out of space. And we've been looking for about a year and a half for a place to be our permanent church home. And so uh, we've been looking for that. And then about in like October-ish, we came to the church and said that we had found a property on South Main Street. It's two and a half acres, multiple buildings on it, 32,000 square feet of building space um, on South Main Street, not far from here. Um, that we had entered into a contract to buy for the church. And so we were really excited about that. But we had to, it, it listen, it's a fixer-upper, okay? She's <laughs> she not gonna, pretty right she's, now. She's not pretty. She's not, she's not pretty. pretty. But we'll be pretty. Um, but we saw the potential, and so we entered into a contract to buy it. We've been working on tons of things, environmental studies, appraisal surveys, yada, yada, you, you name it, all that stuff. Don't bury the lead here. I'm not going to bury the lead. We've been working on all that stuff, but we haven't been talking about it over the last few months very much because we didn't want to get everybody really excited until it was real, um, and we knew that we were going to close. And so we've been working on it, working on it. The trustees have put hours and hours and hours into this process, and I want you to know that we are closing on the property Thursday morning. All right? So it's been a long journey getting to this point been a long journey getting to this point where if everything goes as planned and it should thursday morning we're going to close and we will own that property by easter which is awesome we won't meet there for easter we'll still be here yeah okay so like i said it needs some work but I, here's what i want to do I, this is so incredible i want to tell you the story of how we got there okay? in two minutes or less maybe <laughs> when we went when we went into y'all will process, never complain about my host comments again haha <laughs> <laughs> When we went into this process, we've been saving diligently. We've been saving 10% of our offerings for the last seven years so that we could make a wise decision later when the time came. And so we've been saving and saving and saving, and the goal was to be able to do this, to purchase this property without having to do a big you know, church-wide fundraiser, giving campaign, capital campaign, people making commitments over yada, yada years and all that kind of stuff. We didn't want to do that. We felt like that would not being consistent with the culture of our church and who we are. And so the plan was, and you hear me say was, the plan was to um, come to closing with $250,000 in cash that we had saved over the last seven years and then get a loan for the, the difference, about $500,000, because the purchase price on the property is $750,000. Um, 
Now, if you heard what I said earlier about how much property is and how much building is on that property, that's a ridiculous deal. And it is. Um, and the, if you're wondering what building it is, it's currently owned by Goodwill. It's on South Main Street, like down toward, sort of towards Jake Alexander. They have their career services center in there right now. Um, and they're going to stay. They're selling us the property. They're going to stay and rent from us, and we're going to renovate the rest of it. Okay, that's the plan. Um, so the plan was bring 250000 in cash to closing and, um, and get a loan for the rest. And so we found a ministry-based financing company um, out of California that agreed to do the loan with us. And we've been talking with them since um, October, November. And we've been getting all the things done and getting everything ready. And we're getting ready. The close date with the owner was uh, on or before March 31st of, the, of this year, um, which is Easter, by the way. Um, close date was March 31st. And... A week and a half ago, the bank, when we were waiting for the final loan proposal to sign and be locked in and done and then tell you all about it, the bank called, a banker called me um, a week and a half ago and said that the, their loan committee had decided not to do the loan. Yeah. yeah. To say I was devastated was, would be an understatement after all the time and effort that we had put into this and we were in a position where there's no way to secure new financing in two weeks we didn't think the owner was going to move the close date back because we'd already moved it back once and we didn't think the prospect was there to do it again and so when i got that call the only thing that i could think is we're going to have to walk away from this we're just going to have to cut our losses and we're going to have to walk away and we're going to have to start over and that was very hard to to swallow and so we met with the the trustees we did an emergency meeting with the trustees and said, here's the deal. There's no way for us to get financing. It looks like we're going to have to walk away. And the trustee said, there is another option. And I said, I don't see it. What is it? And they said, we could raise the money. And I said, I, well, first of all, that's not possible. Okay. There was no I, time to announce it. There's no, there was no time to announce it here and to ask everybody to contribute and collect commitments. And then because you have to, we'd have to collect commitments and then everybody would have to, we'd have to make sure that we got to the number and then everyone would have to give and they would all have to clear the bank and all that. There's just no time to do that. And so I didn't see an option. And they said, we could raise it. I said, yeah, this is impossible. We got three days. It was three days until we had to give an answer to, to the, bu the building owner. And they said, let us try. I was like, if you want to try, you can try. I mean, I don't know. I've been, I've been, my first job here in Rowan County when we moved here was with the United Way. Did a lot of fundraising. Hated it. I loved them. It wasn't them. It was, it was I hated fundraising. I've done, been in church ministry, done a lot of capital campaigns and things like that. And I never liked doing it. And, um, and I was like, it's just not possible. $500,000 in three days is not possible. And the trustee said, listen, we're just going to call some people that we think can do a lot quickly and see if we can get there. And by the end of the day on Tuesday, we had $500,000 committed in three days. Can you believe that? So it was, I'm, I'm telling you, it was, it was, a, I've, I've never seen anything like it. I've just never seen anything like it. It was a miracle. And this is what that means. It means on Thursday, when we go to closing, we're not going and getting a loan. On Thursday, when we go to closing, we're paying cash for the property. That's unbelievable. And and the way that sets our church up to do ministry, continue doing ministry going forward is unbelievable. And as we go forward, now, listen, that's the purchase, okay? She, like, she needs some work. I'm not her. No, I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to do that. That was, <laughs> if you don't know, that's my wife, by the way. <laughs> Jess, what? Uh, was, no. You're never no, invited to host coming not again. Even, not even that. No, but, but so we still got the renovation. So, if you, so as we go forward, if you want to contribute, if you want to be a part of it, if you want to support it, if you want to, we're going to have opportunities for you, you know, to help make things happen financially if you'd like to do that. We're going to have opportunities to get our hands dirty and to work over there, but it'll be locked in as of Thursday. And what an unbelievable time for our church. And so uh, we're going to, but we continue moving forward. It's going to take a little while. We don't know exactly how long the renovation is going to take. It's going to take us a little bit, but we'll all dig in now together, talk about it a good bit and and move forward so this is a really exciting time for us yeah and i think what john said is really important there's going to be a ton of opportunity for us as a church to really build this legacy together of the next phase of carolina family church which is really really exciting 
but also we're going to be able to do it in a way that doesn't impact the high level of ministry that we are currently doing for each other and to the community. And that has always been the heart of this church. And so it was so important to us to figure out a way that we could maintain the level of generosity and the level of care that we give um, through the Family Center and through our services. And so um, we know that that comes from your continued generosity. So several of you came prepared to give today and we're thankful for that. You are the ones that support the day-to-day ministry that we do for everyone that is impacted by our church. And so all the ways to give are listed on the screen, but we are just so incredibly excited to move into this next phase. We've had several phases of our church together. We've had the middle school phase. We had the online only phase. Now we will have the children's theater phase and we will move into our permanent location phase. And it's just so exciting to be a part and to be here um, to continue learning about the, or reading through the Gospel of Luke, to get ready to celebrate Easter together, and really to get ready to worship together. So that's what we're about to do next. We're going to sing a few more songs. Before then, I would love for you to stand up, cheer, high five, praise, be excited. You're only going to be cramped for so long. The countdown is on. Let's go. All right, that's exciting stuff. And, uh, and there's so much great in front of us. And so to celebrate, we're gonna sing our Woo songs today. Okay, if you've been around, you know, we got our Woo songs and we often do these songs together. They both have parts in them where we're just singing Woo and not some lyrics. And uh, some people are like, I don't know what the deal is with those Woo but I always like to, like I always like to say that uh, when we, when we do these, that, uh, you know, we, when we worship God, it's not always with words. It's not always with lyrics. It's with our hearts. And we can worship through something that, you know, doesn't have a, a, a place in Webster's dictionary. Um, and I'll tell you that there have been times over the last few months where, where we, you know, me personally, our family has been at super high highs and where we've been at super low lows. And there are times in life where you don't even have words to express how you're feeling. And so, um, uh, so there are times where it's just, you know, an, an, an utterance, a, a groaning, uh, uh, yay, uh, uh, something um, in that spectrum. And um, so that's what these woe-o's are. So when you, when you sing them, um, just let them be an, an act of praise. But the, the first song is about simply the, the gift that Christ gave us on the cross, what that, how we're going to live uh, because of that, and his resurrection and how we're going to live because of that. And then we're going to go into um, the next song that sings of his goodness. And so, um, yeah, here we go. Let's just jump right into it. Whoa. You shed your blood So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone Won't be shackled to the way I was Oh, I'm gonna live like my chains are gone Oh, I'm going 
gonna live like a stone is gone, gone. Now my sin is dead and gone, and I sing hallelujah. Done, done. He is risen, it is done, and I sing hallelujah. your heart be troubled. Hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. Take courage. Hold on. Be strong. Remember where our help comes from.
praise go up as the walls go down. All creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound. All his children, clean hands, pure hearts, good grace go down. His name is Jesus. Swing wide, all you heavens, let the praise go up as the walls come down. we thank you for this time you've given us to gather here in this place and to give you all that we have to worship you with all of our heart with all of our mind with all of our soul with all of our strength and we pray that everything that happens here today whether it's a, a song that goes up a prayer that's given to you whether it's a decision that's made as we read you, your word and learn and are changed and grow we pray that you are honored and pleased with all of it to you be all of the honor and the glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad all of you have joined us today. And I love the Syracuse shirt I saw out in the room, by the way. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, and uh, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm a little amped up, so I need to just, I need to, I need to calm down a little bit so I don't talk a million miles a second. Um, it's an exciting time for the church, but I do also want to say that anytime, 
Anytime things go up, things also have a tendency to go down. There's this contrast that happens. And Jess and I were, um, were talking recently about this, just that, that when things are going really, really awesome, it seems like something else happens that's really, really tragic. And, and so while we are going through really great things as a church, there are things that people in our church are going through that are very difficult and very tragic. And it's important during these times to celebrate with each other and also to cry with each other. And so whatever your situation is and wherever you're coming from and what your background is or what your current situation is, I just want you to know whatever whatever's going on, that we're here for each other to walk through this together. As we're reading in um, Luke chapter 6, Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Plain, and he's got these new disciples, the people that have started following him. He's also got these religious leaders that are hanging, around, hanging out and checking him out and trying to figure out what's going on with him. And he's looking at people that at this point are on a high. They, Jesus, they, they joined into Jesus' ministry, and he's healing people, and he's teaching, and he's casting out demons, and all this unbelievable stuff is, is happening. But he's looking at people who are on this unbelievable high in ministry, and he needs them to know that at some point, that's all going to come crashing down. And the way that they think about themselves, and the way that they think about God, and the way they think about ministry, and the way they think about other people is going to make the difference on whether they can walk through the lows as faithfully as they walk through the highs. And so he's preparing them for that. And this is something Jesus often does. And we, we talk a good bit about it here. When Jesus has a real high in ministry, like feeding the 5,000 or, or things like that, that were really public and really big and people were really amped up. He always looks back at them and gives them a reality check because I want you to know what you're really in for here. All right. Because we live in a world that is full of sin and full of death and difficulty and challenge. And as believers, our job is to walk through that faithfully, looking forward to the day when Jesus returns and sets all things right. But in the meantime, we have to walk through all that stuff and walk through it faithfully. Walk through it looking like Jesus instead of looking like everybody else. So the Sermon on the Plain is explaining to them how to do that. All right. I, I, I'm, I, I often feel that when we go through well-known pieces of Scripture, I have to spend more time saying... Let me tell you what Jesus is not saying than actually telling you what he is saying. <laughs> because these verses are so, in some cases, are so well known that they are also very misunderstood and taken out of context to mean whatever people want them to mean. So I feel like I often have to say, let me tell you what he's not saying here, just to be clear. And I'm going to have to do that a good bit today because we're going to read a bunch of passages that are very, very familiar. All right. So first of all, I want to set the stage for those of you that may be new with us to make a couple of points clear. One is that as Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Plain, he is not sharing the gospel, the good news of how to be saved. This is not about how to be saved. And it could be very confusing if you read it that way and say, oh, well, I have to do this and I have to do this and I have to do this to be saved. No, that's not what Jesus is doing. We are saved by the work of Jesus on the cross, his death in our place on the cross, and his resurrection on the third day. We put our faith in him for salvation, and we are saved. It's not by anything that we do. It's not by any good work or character change or any of that. We are saved by what Jesus did on the cross, and that's all. But then we start a life of following Jesus called discipleship, and it is then our decision in the leadership and power of the Spirit to determine how much like Jesus we are going to look. How, much, how closely we're going to follow him. And some people end up following him very closely, and some people end up following him very little. That's a decision that we have to make, and the Spirit leads us into that and empowers us as we do it. But we do have to make that decision. So Jesus is looking at people that have, at this point, have chosen to follow him. And so he's teaching them, if you're going to follow me, here's what that's going to look like. All right, that's what he's doing here. So for us today, if you want to follow Jesus, if you want to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus, this is what your life will look like as well, and mine will as well. All right, so we're going to get in to um, uh, Luke chapter 6 and verse 37. And if, and if you just going to take a second to get there, um, you obviously, um, you could bring a Bible with you, and many of you do. I can see them in the room. Um, you can also, we'll also put the scripture on the screen, um, but I kind of like having something in, in front of me. It gets me familiar and comfortable in scripture. Um, so don't let, don't just default to the screen. If you bring a Bible with you, you can bring a print Bible, or we also, uh, you can ha download the app. Um, the YouVersion Bible app is the one I recommend. And then within that app, if you click on the little menu at the bottom, you can select, I think you have to click more and then click events and you can find our service right now. And all the scriptures for today will be right there in front of you in order. So, um, and you can take notes and save those notes and everything. It's really cool. So, um, hopefully by now you're at Luke chapter six, verse 37. And these verses, I guarantee you, Hey, if you're not even a Christian and you don't know the first thing about, about the Bible, I bet you know this verse. 
I bet you've heard this verse somewhere, all right? This, these, this is Jesus speaking. Luke 6, verse 37. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. We like this one, right? <laughs> we like, judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. All right? Now, now listen. Again, it's important to say this is... So the tendency might be to read the scripture, to pull it up out of the context and to read the scripture and to say, oh, this is talking about me and my relationship with God. No, it's not. All right. It's not. The, the context, what, what Jesus has been talking about, and if you were with us last week for the message, you know this. The context is Jesus is talking about our relationships with other people. Okay? It's about what we do when people persecute us, what we do when people attack us, what we do when people speak poorly about us, and what our response to that is going to be. And then the verse right before this says, be merciful as God is merciful. So this is not about what God, this is not about our relationship with God. This is about treating other people the way that God treats us. So when it says, when Jesus says, judge not lest you be judged, he's not talking about God judging us. He's saying, don't judge other people, because if you do, they are going to judge you. Later, he's going to say, but the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I once had um, a pastor, when I was at, on, uh, with the Cove Church in Morrisville, Pastor Mike did this visual, and I wanted to do the visual, and then I forgot. Uh, and he had, he had a pot, and inside the pot, he had a ladle, and he had a teaspoon. <laughs> and he said, so if you want to use the ladle of judgment, you can use the ladle of judgment, but guess what? You're getting the ladle back. <laughs> and if you want to use the teaspoon, you can use the teaspoon. But guess what? You're getting the teaspoon back. So, so if you judge other people, and listen, I don't have to prove this to you, do I? Ever, ever met or seen a judgmental Christian? You ever? What's the response to that? When, when Christians act judgmentally or with condemnation to other people, what do they get in return? Judgment and condemnation. And Jesus is like, hey, you don't want that. Like, Jesus stands up well to that, but you won't, and I won't. So what happens? Christians are judgmental of other people. People just respond with the same level or greater of judgment on them. And what happens? The Christians were proved to be hypocrites, right? Then they don't believe Jesus because of the way that we behaved. Don't judge lest you be judged. Don't condemn lest you be condemned. Judging is about internal, okay? Judging is, is about internal, and condemning is about external. And he says, don't do that. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. There's a very different tone that he's encouraging his disciples to take with people around them. A tone that says that I'm going to operate on this level even if you continue to operate on this level. So I'm going to forgive you, and I'm going to love you, and I'm going to speak well of you, and I'm going to bless you, and I'm going to do good to you, all the things we talked about last week, even if you're not doing any of those things to me. And I'm going to choose not to pronounce judgment or condemnation on you because that's just what I'll get in return. Judge not, lest you be judged. Now, people really love this verse. Um, Non-Christians love this verse because then when they feel like they're being judged by Christians, they're like, well, Jesus said, judge not. You know? <laughs> well, he did. But I also want to say what, tell you another thing he's not saying here. Jesus is not saying that we should never pronounce judgments about things. He's not saying that we should never call out sin for what it is. He's not saying we should overlook sin and just let it happen. He's not saying any of that. If... If that were the case, forgiveness would never be required because for forgiveness to happen, there has to be recognition of something having been done wrong. So it's not that. He's not saying that we should never judge. We should never see what sin is. We should never call it out. This is a warning about our heart and our approach to people, about the tone of our relationships, about understanding the nature of the relationship that you have with someone and the right way to approach that relationship. All right? And you say, well, what do I do if somebody that I love, somebody that I truly love and care about is sinning, and I feel like I need to tell them about that? Don't worry. Story's coming in just a second. He's going to explain exactly how to do that. Because he's not saying not to call out sin, not to hold people accountable. He's saying this is a warning. It's not a, it's not a prohibition of all judgment of sin at all. It's a warning about how people will react to us and how to minister to them and how to represent God's desire for them to them because God does not want to judge or condemn us. He wants to forgive us Amen. and we have to respond to that. 
So our desire for other people, even if they may be our enemy, even if they may, they, they may spitefully use us is the way Jesus put this, so they may speak poorly about us, our desire for them should be the same as God's desire for them, which is not to judge or condemn them, but to forgive them, Amen. ultimately for their good. And when that's truly existing in our heart, and I know in, in groups, in our, in our group, we talked a lot about this, the, the transforming of our heart to look at people differently and to want good for them, even if they're treating us badly, the transformation of love that happens in our heart towards other people. If that's truly happening, and we're choosing not to judge and judge, not to condemn, then we have a loving foundation on which potentially to talk to someone about their sin and to help them um, be more faithful to God in those things. And so, but it's about, it's about tone. It's about the foundation of the relationship. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And really what this is, is an application of the golden rule that he just gave. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Do you want other people to judge you? Do you want other people to condemn you? Or do you want people to forgive you? So you're gonna choose to do those things for other people, regardless of their response. All right? All right. Lost my place. One really looking at the notes. Um, all right, so story's coming. He is going to tell a story in just a second about how to, um, how to do this in a good way. Um, but before that, he's going to give another example um, in verse 38. Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will it be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. I need to do another here's what Jesus isn't saying moment. Okay, let me tell you what Jesus is not saying when he says, give and it will be given to you. He is not talking about tithing. Okay, tithing is the, is, is the, t the practice in the law of giving 10% of your income to the church. And actually it was bigger than that. For the, for the Israelites who were under the law, it was, it was 23 and a third percent of their income. It functioned as as support of the ministry, but also as taxes and also as benevolence. They, they gave 10% to the priest. They gave 10% to the poor. And then they put away three and a, three and a third percent because it was 10% every three years um, so that they could take time off to observe the feasts and the festivals. So that's what they were required to do. It was, it was based in the law. We are Christians in the New Testament. We are not under the law anymore. We look at the law. We learn from the law. We understand what God's desires are for our life, but we are not under the law anymore. And this is something that I have learned over the course of my ministry. Early on in my ministry, I believed that, that if a Christian didn't tithe, they were sinning. I believed that scripture said that a New Testament Christian was supposed to tithe. There's lots of verses that are used to try and make that point. I was taught incorrectly. I didn't do enough research on my own. And then I ultimately taught this incorrectly. And I thought I, I, thought I was on the right track of trying to be faithful, but I got it wrong. And I've learned since then that that's not, in fact, true. It had all the arguments, and if you want to talk about that, we can talk about that later. But this was a verse that I would use when I was preaching to try and bring this from a, uh, from a negative thing, you have to give 10% of your income to the church, to a, a positive thing, which is if you do this, if you tithe, then God will bless you. He will fill your barns to overflowing. He will, he will give you a good measure, press down, shaken together, making room for more and spilling over the top. And what is the subtext of that message? <laughs> if you give money to God, God will give money to you. And that, I'm sorry, is it's not true. <laughs> it's not true. It is true that when we are generous, and that's what we're called to be, and that could happen in a lot of different ways, in a lot of different places, at a lot of different scales and moments. When we choose to be generous as people to honor God, we are absolutely blessed by that. Now, it may not be dollars in the, in the, in the checking account. It may not be that our investments go bonkers or we get the big promotion. But we, we are filled with a sense of, of, of purpose and, and meaning because we were created to live in harmony and community and fellowship. And when we give, that's what we're tangibly doing. And it is absolutely true that we will be rewarded later in the kingdom with Jesus when that time comes. And we are taking a then mentality rather than a now mentality. So he wants us to be generous, but this is not a legalistic, you must do this, you must do that, or promise from God that he's going to give you money if you give money to his ministries. We've said it. I said it a couple weeks ago, and I'll say it over and over again. God is not a genie in a bottle. God is not a vending machine, and I'll add one. God is not an ATM. 
okay? Not the way it works. Not the way it works. The blessings that God gives are way better than any of that stuff. So we don't give as a way of, of, of getting money back or anything like that. We just give because we love him and because we love other people and we want to help where we can help to advance his ministry. And so that's what we're supposed to, that's what he wants these disciples to put on their heart. Be generous with other people. This is about them and other people. Okay, this is not, he's not telling the, the disciples that they have to give to his ministry. He's not saying, make sure that you give 10% to our ministry so that we can do X, Y, Z. He wants them to put on a generous heart and to understand that if they're generous with people who are stingy to them or are trying to take advantage of them because of their kindness, they are going to continue to be generous and ultimately they will be rewarded for that. So they're going to think then instead of now. That's what he's trying to do with them. All right. So sorry about that. A little bit of a soapbox. Anyway, um, and I know there's some more there, and you may have questions about that. Shoot me an email, and I, I, I can explain more about that if you have questions about specific verses or other things. Oh, priest Melchizedek gave before, yada, yada, that kind of thing. Okay? Um, I'd love to answer any of that. But what a beautiful, this is what we have found to be true and what Jesus is trying to lead them to. To live a generous life, a loving, gracious, kind, merciful, generous life, even if that's not what we're getting in return, it is truly the best way to live. It is the best way to live. It's the way to hold our head high and to know that we are being faithful to God and God is pleased with the kind of life we're living because we are learning more and more and more for our life to reflect the life of Jesus because this is how he lived. And Jesus very specifically here wants his listeners to be able to see the contrast between what he's exemplifying and in groups this week, by the way, you're going to read um, a story from John chapter 8 where Jesus literally exemplifies every single thing that he said here. He does it in a very tense situation. And you're going to talk about the, the connections between all of that. But not only the way that Jesus taught, but the way that he lived. And Jesus wants them to see the difference between that and what their other religious leaders are doing and saying. He needs them to see the contrast between the way the Pharisees are leading them and teaching them, which is very worldly and very self-righteous and, and legalistic, and what Jesus is trying to show them. In verse 20, 39, he speaks a parable to them, and he spoke a parable to them. Can the blind lead the blind? Will they not both fall in a ditch? And if I can pause for a second, you say, that's kind of a funny picture. <laughs> yep. If you didn't know this already... Jesus is funny, okay? Throughout scripture, Jesus cracks jokes. Last time I checked, a sense of humor was not sinful. And Jesus had a sense of humor. And we miss it often because we're not looking for it, one, or because we don't really understand their sense of humor because it was different then and there than it is here and now. But Jesus is making a joke here. He wants you to get the visual of a blind person leading a blind person and then falling into a ditch, which may not be PC, but Jesus said it here. And <laughs> you have to admit, it's kind of a funny picture. And later in scripture, Jesus calls the Pharisees blind guides. Okay, you're gonna read that verse again in group this week. He calls them blind guides. He said, they can't see. They, they, they don't know what they're doing. They're walking in the darkness. So can they lead someone else? Aren't they just gonna end up falling in a ditch? Yes, and that's exactly what what had happened. He says, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. So he said, you know, if you're going to follow me, you're going to become like me. And if you're going to follow them, you're going to become like them. Amen. So which one are you going to follow? Which example are you going to commit your life to, to following and being faithful to? He wants them to contrast this with the Pharisees. The Pharisees are judgmental, they're condemning, they're unforgiving, and they're stingy. Okay. Huh? And so he's, don't follow that. Don't follow that. Jesus followers will do Jesus things. And Pharisee followers will do Pharisee things. So they need to listen to him and they need to follow him. We're going to look like Jesus. We're going to do what he did. We're going to listen to his teaching and try and put it in place in all aspects of our life. All of these things that we've been learning. And we're going we're gonna to let the world know by our statements and by our actions that we follow him. And try to represent him the best way we possibly can. Today's going to be an awesome day. We've got a bunch of people that are going to be baptized at the Y. Just mentioned this at the East Rowan YMCA in Rockwell. All right. Uh, later today. And this is one step in the journey for them of saying boldly and publicly they have accepted Jesus as their Savior. And they want us to know it. And they're going to display that in front of us and commit themselves to being a disciple of Jesus. It's such a beautiful thing to see. That's what we're doing. 
All right. So how do we do this and how do we do it with each other? Let's keep going. Verse 41. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? I'll reiterate. This is a joke. It's not, it's not a joke in that it doesn't have a serious meaning. It's a joke in that Jesus, this is cartoonish, and Jesus wants you to visualize a person going up to help somebody else with a little speck of sawdust in their eye while they have a two-by-four sticking out of their own eye. Okay, that's the visual. He wants you to get that. Everybody in the crowd might have chuckled a little bit when he, when he said this. All right. Jesus was a dynamic uh, speaker and, and very engaging and, and certainly used humor. Another great example, I love giving this one, um, is when Jesus is talking about how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, which isn't about being saved, but it's about being a disciple again. Um, but he says, he says, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And, um, and people have taken that so seriously over the years and they've tried to figure out, oh, well, you know, I've heard, well, there's a needle gate in Jerusalem and, and a rich man came in the middle of the night. He, this is the only gate open in Jerusalem. And so you'd have to unpack your camel and you'd have to go through the walls and go in. And so a rich man has to unpack his camel to go through. And I'm like, no, uh, I mean, that's an interesting idea, but Jesus is making a joke. He, 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 it's hyperbole. It's one of the primary forms of humor that he used. And he uses it over and over and over again in scripture. It's an exaggeration. So we're supposed to literally imagine a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. That's how difficult it is. What a challenge it is to be faithful to him when we have great wealth. And so, so he's talking, um, you know, this, this is a joke. He wants us to visualize the two-by-four coming out of someone's face. But, of course, it's a very serious and important lesson we learned from it. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not perceive the plank in your own eye? Or how could you say to your brother, let me help remove the speck that is in your eye, when you yourself do not see the plank that is in your own eye? Hypocrite! First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. So it's not that we're not supposed to help people with the specks in their eyes. It's that we're supposed to be concerned about our own faithfulness and Christ-likeness first, and then only founded on that, in love, do we go to someone and help them. Problem is, most people who go point out someone else's sin are absolutely not doing it because they love them, even though they may think that or they may even say that. They're doing it from a self-righteous place, where if I can point this thing out to you, then I can be justified, and I can be the savior, or I could be whatever. But truly helping and holding someone accountable comes from a place of humility and honesty with ourselves. And to say, I'm working on my own stuff here, but I love you and I want to help you with your stuff. And so that is what Jesus is showing us. That's what he's showing us that we need to be doing with each other. Not from a place of judgment, not from a place of condemnation, from a place of love to lovingly help one another as we go through what we go through. There's a difference, a massive difference between a humble person who lovingly corrects us, think of yourself on the other side of this. There's a massive difference between someone who lovingly corrects us and an arrogant person who judgmentally condemns us. And I, I would imagine we've all experienced both and we can see the difference. Which one is Jesus? Which one is the Pharisees? Which one are the people that you follow? And I mean, your, your leaders, your idols, your role models, your representatives, your influences, influencers, which one are they? Which one are you? Are you going to be a person of grace and mercy and love and sacrifice, a person of kindness, of generosity, or are we going to be a finger pointer? Jesus said, verse 43, for a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. It's not a complicated concept. An orange tree has orange tree has oranges on it, right? An apple tree has apples on it. 
A Jesus disciple does Jesus things. A Pharisee's disciple does Pharisaic things. A disciple of the world does worldly things. So which am I? And which are you? The fruit, and I would, we don't want to get too far with this analogy. The fruit doesn't define the tree, but the fruit identifies the tree. And so when people look at my life, when people look at your life, what tree do they see? Do they see a Jesus tree? Do they see the things that truly look like him? Kindness and grace and mercy and love and generosity, care and compassion, freedom and joy and hope? Do they see Jesus things? So that they identify this tree. One of the, the most um, interesting moments in scripture to me is the first time that Christians were called Christians. They were called members of the way or disciples of Jesus or other things before that. But there was a moment in scripture where they're first called Christians and it's because people looked at them and it was actually an act of mockery at first. But they looked at them and they said, those people are like Jesus. I mean, you could try to insult me with that, but... What an honor, okay? My, my middle son, Jairus, um, has a tendency or he has this new habit of looking at someone when you say something ridiculous and you'd be like, wow, it's a little foggy outside. And, and he'll say, you're foggy outside. Boom, roasted. <laughs> that, it's his favorite joke right now. I don't know if he's in here or not, but it's his favorite joke right now. And, uh, and, I, and I said, Jairus, you know what I'm going to do? He said, well, I said, I'm going to start doing the same thing because I'm going to wait for th- like good things. And this is what I'm going to do. Be like, man, it's a beautiful day outside. And I'll be like, you're a beautiful day. Boom, toasted. That's what I'm going to start doing. Okay? <laughs> Boom, toasted. <laughs> and I just told that joke, and I had a reason for telling it, and now I can't even remember what it was. <laughs> there was a point there. Huh? A Jesus follower does Jesus things. Yeah, a cho- I don't know. I don't, golly, I had a connection. I'm sorry. This isn't easy, you know. <laughs> this week in and week out, I, I just lost my train of thought there. Right? Oh, what what defines me? Okay. I mean, what's our perspective? I think that might have been where I was going with it. What's our perspective? You know, are we looking to say good things about people? Are we looking to say negative things about people? To roast people or to toast people? There you go. There it is. Sure, that's fine. No, no applause. No applause. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Oh, this has gone off the rails. So the question is, the question that we need to ask ourselves is, what defines me? When people look at me, what do they see? Who do they see? What do they see a reflection of? And am I going to be all of these things that Jesus is? And that's a decision. Now, the Spirit, the Spirit leads you to that decision. The Spirit leads you through Scripture so you can see how to do it. The Spirit uh, empowers you and guides you as you do But you and I have to make the choice to say, I want to be like him as much as I can. And so show me the the bad fruit on the tree. He said that he said the fruit, the the, the, the bad comes out of the bad treasure of our heart. So So this is where it begins. So what is the treasure of my heart? What do I really want? What do I value? What do I want to see happen in my life? What do I want to see happen in other people's lives? So that that then wells up and comes out. For out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And then as I speak and as I act, the fruit matches the kind of tree that I want to be. It's all working together. And that's a decision that every single one of us has to make on a daily basis. Am I going to follow and emulate Jesus? Or am I going to follow and emulate the world or this, this person or that person? Am I going to do that? What is the treasure of my heart? What do I really want? What do I really want to see happen? Where is my wealth? Where is my treasure? Where is my hope? Where is my confidence? Where is my focus? Where is my purpose? All of that is existing right here in our heart, in our soul. What is the treasure of my heart? And is that truly flowing out of me to be and represent what I want to be and represent? What is the evidence in my words? So that when people look at me, when people look at you, they say, that looks like the real Jesus. That makes all the difference in the world. 
And so in group, you're going to talk about a lot of this and what it really means and get practical with it. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of a group if you're not already. But we'll continue processing this. When you leave here, keep answering these questions, looking at your life, looking at the fruit, and answering the question of whether my life is looking more and more like his. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can be called your sons and daughters, your children, that by faith in Christ, we can become part of your family, that we can put our faith in Jesus, in his work on the cross, and in his resurrection, that anyone today who hasn't done that before this moment but believes in him and wants to trust him for salvation can do that right now, and you'll forgive them of their sins. Welcome them into your family in this moment. Fill them with the Spirit so that they can learn what it means to follow Jesus and be empowered to do so. And that the majority of us who've made that decision before today and those who might make that decision today, as we walk forward in faith together as sons and daughters of God and brothers and sisters in Christ, would allow, would, would allow you to change the treasure of our heart to align it with Jesus and then let the world see what is truly within us. Some are going to proclaim that for the first time publicly through baptism today, which is incredible. And as we all do that day in and day out, that what people would see, the fruit on the tree, would look like Jesus, would look like his kind of love and compassion and grace and mercy, that you would teach us how to see people the way that you see people, to see that people are, are sinful and they're broken and they're hurting and they're separated from you and they make mistakes day in and day out. And we have the opportunity to represent the Son of God to them and to follow him into Christ's likeness, into the transformation into his image. And so what we're asking God is that you change, you, you highlight and then you change anything that you need to in the treasure of our heart so that we will pursue this with our whole life. Thank you for a group of, of brothers and sisters in Christ in this church that will do that together, that will point out sin, not with planks in our eyes, but, but one person with a speck to another person with a speck would lovingly point these things out and to help encourage and move each other forward so that we can all see you with clearer vision. And so, Father, we thank you for all of that today and um, all that you're leading us to do, we make commitment to do. We celebrate everything you are doing in our lives and in this world and look forward with hope and confidence to the day, Jesus, that you return and establish your kingdom here when then becomes now and all of this work, all of this effort pays off and we're walking in the life and kingdom that we've wanted for so long. We look forward to that day, Father, and thank you that you're with us as we wait. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And we're going to finish today by singing about the brotherhood and sisterhood that we have in Christ. So if you'll stand with us, we'll sing Sons and Daughters. We are the Lord's and he will never forsake.
forsake his own. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. His love he lavished on us and called us children of the King. And in his love and kindness, he chose the lowly and the weak. And his heart is good, he is always kind. With the cross he proved, he is on my side. We are the sons, we are the daughters of God. No matter where we go, we're close to the Father's heart. Though we stumble, He will not let us fall. We are the Lord's and He will never forsake His own. We are the sons. We are daughters of God. When the lies speak louder than the truth, remind me I belong to you. When I can't see So there are few truths in church ministry. Excuse me, I'm just going to get you out of the way there. <laughs> uh, there are few truths in church ministry. Um, Don and I, we've been involved in it in a long time. And, and one of those truths is that 
Palm Sunday is one of the lowest attendance Sundays. Um, and it's because everyone's gearing up for Easter, right? You got to go on Easter. <laughs> um, and this room just broke an attendance record. <laughs> and, and listen, I, I say that, I say that for a very specific reason, okay? It doesn't matter if there were 10 of us in the room today or if there were over 200 of us in the room today. What matters is that we make the choice individually to live like Jesus. And then together, we go out and we change our families, we change our community, and we change our world because we're individually committed to a much larger purpose and family. And whether you're here visiting because someone you love is being baptized next, amazing, you get to do this too. This isn't a Carolina Family Church thing. In fact, how horrible if we just stuck to ourselves. But what we get to do is we get to love well when people are hurting, when our church family is hurting. We love well when people that we know are in need. We live generously. And all of us work to know God, to find hope, to live free, and to do good. That is the goal. That is the bigger goal. John mentioned groups. There's tons of information of group on our groups online, or we use an app called Church Center. Um, you can go see Rhonda at the resource table. If you're going to the baptism, if you're going to the baptism, one o'clock, we're going to enter the side doors of the East Rand YMCA. Don't try to go in the front doors. We're going to enter in the side doors. There'll be people there. Um, we're going to enter in the side doors and have direct access to um, the water. Okay. So I hope to see all of you there. And if I don't, we are praying for you. We love you. And we'll see you next week.